Uh, so, so, so we talked, we spent a little bit of time talking about the basics. Uh, Russ brought up the point that explainability has been uh, being discussed since as early as uh, Shortlift's 1975 original uh, paper on artificial intelligence. Uh, we're basically in explainability talking about do we, can we explain how the black box works. Um, uh, a, a nice point that was made was to explain why AI did not make a specific recommendation. That's something we discussed as being relatively easy for a person to do, but quite hard for an AI to do. Um, we, want, uh, we, want, we discussed AI that recognizes that it can't model everything. I would describe that as discussing uncertainty measurement. You know, can the AI uh, give it a, a sense of uncertainty in its, in its recommendations? Um, and of course, as Archana mentioned, this plays a role in fairness and ethics. Then I think we went deeper. Um, uh, are, are the prediction cases in the span of the data being used for training? That was an important point that was uh, repeatedly brought up. For example, melanoma uh, classification trained on only on people with white skin or automated cars where you didn't cha train on the instance where a kid chases a ball out into the, in, in traffic. Um, we talked about explainability versus predictability. For example, are you willing to pay some, uh, predicti some predictability for a more explainable uh, system? And then that led to a basic discussion of what often AI models are, AI approaches are lacking, are mechanistic models that actually explain the phenomena that's being un, uh, uh, studied. Then we went even deeper. Um, so deeper still, it was raised up as an epistemo epistemological question, epistemology being the study of knowledge itself. Um, do we need explainability? Is it satisfying an unnecessary psychological demand instead of uh, uh, that, that we have that isn't actually technically necessary. Um, we use lots of black boxes already. Is this just the next round of resistance to horseless carriages or indoor bathrooms? Um, uh, a, another th a point that was brought up was AI lacks a model of the world to build off of. It has no conception of the idea of a cat versus detecting the blur of an image when uh, the focus is on pet. So, it's, so in, in certain image classification problems, people take a picture of their cat, they tend to focus on the cat, so sometimes the AI is just detecting whether there's blur in the image in the background. Um, so it doesn't have a conceptual model of the cat, it's really just detecting blur. Um, uh, then there was the point was raised was how explainable are expert decisions themselves? Are we holding AI to a standard that we don't hold humans to? For example, uh, comparing a, a, me a mechanic versus an engineer or a general practitioner versus a specialist. The difference being that often, uh, uh, you know, a general practitioner might be using pattern recognition in their own uh, diagnoses, where a specialist might have thoroughly understood the mechanisms under which they're making their recommendations. And then it ended with some really hard questions like what really is AI? Um, and then um, uh, I think something that got brought up quite a bit was the idea of trust. The reason why we want explainability is really to, uh, uh, tr uh, to, to relay a, a sense of trust, I including related to all sources of variability, including who codes the algorithm and what biases they bring into it. Um, another point being made was that seemingly intelligent AI systems are often dumb. Um, lots of examples where the real heart of an algorithm is something dumb or that we don't want, and that's another reason. Uh, and then I think that's out of my time. Then we spent relatively little time talking about techniques, but I'll share these slides and then I put the references there. Thanks, Ryan. So that, was, that was very academic and enjoyable. Um, so thanks, everyone, for contributing to the breakout sessions. We're going to write a report up um, trying to summarize. There's obviously a lot of really good ideas there. I think the moderators did a wonderful job summarizing what was discussed in a very short period of time. If for any reason either you think we're missing some really important points, either you brought them up in the discussions or you weren't part of the discussions, but you know something brilliant that wasn't said yet, you should just feel free to email me or, or Jeff or Greg um, as we write this up. It would be great to have more input and more ideas uh, and more diversity of thought. So thanks everybody for this session and next is whatever you're going to say. Right. Thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. All right, so uh, my name is Phil Fan from the Cary Business School. My role here is basically to play traffic cop uh, for the last session. Um, I think I'm supposed to have a s slide uh, for the last session. Can somebody help me with that? Thanks, yeah. So uh, the way it's going to work is we've got seven uh, companies. So if my company founders would come to the front so we could uh, get up very quickly. Uh, they have two minutes uh, to basically pitch the problem that they're solving. 
and then discuss uh, challenges that they're facing. So this is not a pitch for the company. This is really to expose all of us to some of the challenges that these companies are facing. Some of them are very emergent, some of them are preclinical, uh, and there are seven of them. And I'll have an, a panel of experts. Um, so if I could have my experts come up and sit uh, over here. Um, Ferdinand Hui from uh, Hopkins Medicine, uh, interventional radiologist. Uh, Edgar Simard from uh, Medtronic. Uh, and uh, Vas Bailey uh, from Artis Ventures. So we've got a clinical expert, uh, a business expert, and a technical expert. And of course, you know, they can share among themselves. They will have four minutes, up to four minutes, to respond to each of the pitches. So we will pitch, uh, and uh, I will ask the, the, the founders to briefly introduce themselves so we don't waste time with me talking about them. Uh, we'll start with uh, Cupid Chan from uh, Pistevio, uh, Harris Sire from Grail, uh, Frank Chan from Link Sciences, uh, Jing Kong Su from um, uh, in Silico Medicine, in Silico Medicine, uh, Greg Bellinger from Deep Look, uh, Sarah Alcon from Betts uh, DSP, and Julia Hall from Orkin. So um, if you could come up. And my job is to just time you out, so I'll cut you off. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let me know when can I start. Stop. Okay, thank you. One of the major expenses in healthcare is the fraud, waste, and abuse, and uh, which estimated to cost about $68 billion annually for the whole industry. And one common cause for this is overbilling. And in order to avoid being accused, some provider decide to swing the pendulum to the other end and keep themselves clean by underbilling. But this actually creates another problem of losing a fair income for a provider should have. And real, we realize the opportunity by a trusted healthcare platform to strike back the balance among the three P's in healthcare system. The first one, the first P is patient. All claims start originated from patient, but it's a common issue that the patient needs to view information repeatedly when visiting doctors, which leads to information loss and inconsistency. We are building a Facebook for healthcare industry so that a patient only needs to note down the history once and the platform enables the patient to share their information flexibly and securely to the second P, provider. An authorized provider then can review and append the information during the encounter and the system will automatically update the EM level in real time. So the doctor can focus on looking after the patient, not to worry if there is enough documentation to support a correct claim level. Finally, the third P, payer. Since each and every action in the system will be law, insurance company will have a more holistic view for the data, and this provides a better understanding and transparency on the received claims and minimize audit overhead because it's based on a single version of truth for the for the claim history. And with Pistival, we believe to transform the traditional way of tackling fraud, waste, and abuse from reacting to suspicious activities to proactively aligning the, an integral community and achieve the real patient first. And with provider billing hassle zero and payer confidence on the claim compliance 100%. The challenge is, like uh, for the three P's here, we don't have a real trust so that we have fraud, waste, and abuse happens. So the like, insurance company doesn't really trust whether the claims standing here is accurate or well documented. And then on the other hand, the doctor may not trust what the patient is document is correct. Hey, yeah, what is your competitive edge? Because I mean, part of like the problem that you say, I think. It exists. We all know the healthcare system is not perfect, but one of the challenges that I have from from listening to it, I still don't know what is your secret sauce, because a large part saying solving everything, I think we'll all just agree that things need to be solved. But mm -hmm. what is it that perhaps you are working on that is unique to you that you actually can make a difference with? Okay, so I think there are two folds. Number one, we are not competing with any like uh, EEHR system or EPIC or CERNA. We are putting ourselves more upstream to the data source, which is the patient. That's number one. And number two, because of our executive team, including me, having an like, uh, in, like, uh, uh, exclusive experience on the claim CMS side, on how the claims is being processed from the insurance company. 
So by applying the knowledge on the other side, then we know that what is really being uh, treated as fraud, waste or abuse and try to help the provider and the insurance company on that level. One last comment before I hand it up is, is Google Health, for instance, in 2002-2003, allowed patients to own their own data. The, the, this, the concept of patients owning it isn't necessarily novel. What is it unique about your platform that, one, you think you'll have widespread adoption, and second, we live with a fragmented provider system and each of them have different EMR systems. So you have to actually, from day one, have an ability for your platform to be compatible with Epic, Cerner, everything else immediately. Uh, how do you enable that? So it's two part. One, understanding gaining market share with customers and people to care enough to use it, mm -hmm. which Google tried with tons of money and failed. And the second part is the pro fragment provider system. Yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, twofold. Number one, we started small and tackling really pain point of the system right now, which is how the EM level being calculated and captured. And, and, and again, it will be from the source of the data, which is the patient. And number two, yes, I know, like uh, Epic or Serena, they're actually trying to tackle this problem. Yep. But we are actually collaborating with them using Fire. Basically, it's the interface. So we're not, we're not competing with them. But we are complementing what they cannot as a big company. They can, not at, they can move as fast as a small company. When we see the, the problem that, that we can fill the gap, we are actually filling the gap and then cooperating with him. And here, even as a startup, I don't mind if one day Epic or Cerner come to us and say, hey, do you, do you mind if we acquire you? That's another option to exit out. Uh, your commercialization plan, can you speak to that at all? I'm just wondering, like, there's obviously a separate kind of value proposition for each of those three Ps. So... I'm sorry, because the echo here, I'm not hearing very well here. Can you repeat one more time? That's okay. We're even then, because I had problems hearing you <laughs> too. So, the com your commercialization plan, um, it's a different value proposition for each of the three Ps that you yes. articulated. So, how are you, you going to get, like, a, I understand how you get a, maybe a patient, but how are you going to get, like, a, a provider and a payer to say, I want to use your platform? Okay, let me try to guess what you're asking, because I I'm, I'm really had a hard time to listen. But... Okay, so uh, a, a, a few, few phase. Number one, as I mentioned, the EM level is one of the pain points for the, for the doctor right now. I want the doctor to focus on treating and looking after the patient. So one way is the hospital, we are going to sell this product to the hospital so that the doctor can focus on taking care of the patient rather than the documentation and see which level, which EM level should I build for. That's one hand. On the other hand, I think like uh, the payer, which is the insurance company, will also be willing to pay us some, something to really looking into the data and see what the trend is, is heading to. And of course, if you, if you pay uh, the attention, throughout the two minutes, I didn't even like, uh, mention AI at all. Because I believe AI here is actually auxiliary to any business model that we are trying to achieve. And by the time we collect the information or data from the provider, from the patient, we do have the database to really turn out the, the AI algorithm. That will provide really the, the value for the insurance company and see what's, it, what's the abnormally for, for the whole data set that we have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, hello. My name is Harris Sayer. I am the director of neuroradiology at Johns Hopkins. I'm going to be talking about Grail, which is actually not a company, but it is software that we're developing. Data being the cornerstone of AI development, the issue is that uh, the current models of AI development utilize retrospective data collection and annotation. That is extremely expensive. Uh, there's a company right now that wants to evaluate their algorithm that I'm working with. For them, for us to evaluate that algorithm, it's going to cost us $400,000, for example. So I had an idea of thinking, okay, why can't we do this prospectively? Because I have to go to the reading room every day, I'm reading cases. Why can't I just annotate and collect all the data as I'm doing my regular work, instead of developing a project afterwards and then retrospectively collecting all that data? So to do that, we developed this tool called Grail, which is a web-based uh, tool that is PAX agnostic and interfaces with the PAX system that you're working with. Um, as I'm reading cases, I can develop a project that I might be interested in or think about a project, and then automatically annotate uh, 
the images and then send it to a server where all that data then is archived. And during that process, the data is also anonymized. So uh, to make sure everything is HIPAA compliant. On the back end, uh, there will be tools available for the algorithm, uh, the, the software, to annotate the images if no robust tools are available on PACS. And uh, on the background, then, we'll probably also develop uh, machine learning algorithms that will be running in the background. There was some information this morning about continuous learning. So we can do that in this prospective method whereby I can add images to the system on an ongoing basis so that the system self-learns itself. The current uh, state status of the tool is that we do have a tool available that uh, we can install uh, to PAX. And we've been using it to anonymize some data. We can do that retrospectively as well, but also prospectively. There is a preliminary annotation tool that's built in, and currently that's where we're at right now. In terms of some of the challenges that we are facing, one is to try to, this is a technical thing, but to try to develop a robust annotation tool that would work well for many different uh, annotation requirements. The other question is really figuring out what kind of business model to further develop this tool. Uh, we were thinking to keep it open source, but even through that venue, um, we need some kind of investment, either from grant funding or whatever it is, to work on, work on it in more detail. So you talked about like the business model. Let's start there. You talked about open source, and that just my ears perked up a little bit because it's hard to think about how 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 are you going to make money with this business to be able to scale? Yeah. Well, in general, people don't really like to pay money for things, right? And then, but Google, but 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 services possibly. So the idea was that we would develop this as a free tool, but if people needed support, then we would have some people that. You know, we'll be able to provide support. But again, I don't even know if that's feasible or not because I don't have a business. My, my suggestion is if your competitive edge is you do actually have a sense of being able to annotate things differently, and you, you do, being part of the Hopkins ecosystem if you can, uh, there is already monetary value in it. And I understand the open source uh, aspect is appealing in, in science, but if this were to be a company that you were starting to encourage you to think about a commercial model that relied on you, monetizing the data you've collected, especially putting in the effort into being able to annotize, uh, annotate the whole thing. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's hard for me to comment on this since I, I have used Grail and involved, so. Awesome. Well, a couple, couple other questions then in terms of like being able to, to scale. Have you thought about like what is the first application or use case? Why not develop the solutions yourself? Yeah. Because instead of like one model is for you to farm it out and have a bunch of people pay you a subscription fee and for you to get a SaaS revenue from it, the other is for you to do that and to be able to build solutions in-house as well. Um, and another part of what I would, have you thought about that at all? And if so, like, uh, what, what would that look like? And well, what would the first application to this be? The first application, honestly, was more selfish reasons, right? And, and that's kind of where Grail was going, is that all the stuff I want to do uh, has been limited for various reasons, and then this actually solved some of those problems. So that's actually the first use case, is that I, I will have some projects to do. And, and we've actually used Grail for these instances, but let, I, I have a CT annotation tool that I'm building, and so that would be the first use of this thing, is that we, we've used that to do this. And my quick comment there is one of my companies, Echo, uh, before, when they were just starting, Hopkins gave away its heart sound data that they had collected for the last 15 years uh, and did not charge them for the data. Mayo Clinic, on the other hand, right now, not only has charged for the data, but they have like licensing fees in every single algorithm, as well as optionality for them to participate in equity in the company to participate. So it's just something for you to think about, like, to not give it away and yeah. to actually try and monetize sure. it. Sure, okay. You know, um, one comment, Harris, just thinking about this, you want open source, well, maybe you think about this, what if patients declared that they want to de-identify their data and make it publicly available? I don't think anybody's doing that. It's 
There, there have been companies that have tried to do that. Helix tried to do that in the genomic space and have, has not had much success in taking it forward. Uh, strangely, you don't have that many people. 23andMe, to some extent, has allowed people to uh, share information back, and they're trying to build a commercial model on it. Uh, it is possible. It's hard to do it at scale. So even for the previous company in yours, there's one way of winning it, which is having a lot of capital. The question becomes, if you don't have like what Thrive at like Johns Hopkins has $100 million to start with, uh, you have to think about incremental innovation. And for that, uh, I think open source becomes hardly compelling to raise your next round of financing. Uh, it would be nice if you had $100 million backing you to be able to say, hey, this is the vision for what you want to do. So I think some of it is also depends on capital constraint uh, and what you're doing. And, and the previous example as well, working with three different healthcare systems at one go, or three different customers makes it very hard to be able to scale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, as a quick note, you see that little uh, uh, website up there. If you want to uh, connect with any of the founders, or if you have suggestions, or if you want to invest, uh, go to the Google form and fill in information, and we will make sure that it gets to the appropriate uh, company so they can reach out to you. Please. The moment you receive a serious medical diagnosis, the focus of your life changes. How do you choose a hospital or provider with the best expertise for your particular disease? If you, you or your families uh, are ever in that shoes before, uh, try Link Medicine. We use big data for your big, de for your big decisions at that trying moment. Hello, everyone. My name is Frank Chen. I got trained in Hawkins for my uh, PhD. And uh, I'm leading a team of uh, clinicians, scientists, and engineers to leverage uh, AI and data technology to improve patient access to medical expertise. So uh, the Link Medicine solution features uh, data-driven platform to provide disease-specific insights. We have made it into a healthcare uh, chatbot system called uh, Dr. Hill, a hospital AI for link medicine, a uh, hospital AI for expertise-based referral. And users can easily access it by uh, uh, talking to the AI, select, uh, uh, select the expertise hospital, and choose the best, ex best, best care for their uh, particular disease and, and disorders. So like many other uh, startups, we are faced with a lot of our challenges, um, including the lack of data, the data availability, and lack of uh, uh, grant tools to label data for proper uh, 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 machine learning and, uh, and, and data training, Re unclear regulatory paths, and uh, lastly, the marketing strategy to bring benefits to uh, all the stakeholders on this value chain. So for the technology challenges, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, established our partial algorithm towards its, uh, its solution. And we're now working closely with clinicians for the validation and, re and re regulatory approvals. For the business-wise, uh, it's very challenging. We have uh, uh, chose to start with a niche market, it's national medicine. Uh, according to federal uh, trade center, a quarter million patients coming to the states for uh, treatment for more advanced treatment options. And for those patients, uh, the first step is to find the best hospital with the particular expertise for his or her uh, uh, diseases. So we have uh, working with leading institutions like Hawkins and the world's largest insurance company like AXA to help them make that more informed decision. We are now transforming our success in the international space into the domestic patients so that we can benefit more patients in this country. Despite the challenges, our team is striving to leverage our technology to better science and medicine because uh, in medicine we have our mission. In medicine is where the world gets well. Thank you so much. Uh, without the microphone for us, it's better. <laughs> better without the mic, right? Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I guess, so there's a clinical decision support kind of component, but then also a, like, a patient component as well. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess from the clinical decision support component, like, what's the um, differentiator versus something like MD Consult or something else that's, like, already well, well established in this space? Uh, so the question is uh, about the the, uh, the functionality of uh, the functional component in this uh, uh, in this uh, link medicine platform, and what is the difference between us and other competitors? So uh, uh, there are different. Uh, so our technology is adapted to multiple uh, segmented markets. 
So um, including the patients, so we use a direct to customer DTC model to do that. And uh, also, you know, uh, after we obtain the, uh, the you know regulatory approval, we can close the clinical you know CCDS uh, you know you know system. So the diff the, uh, the the sharpest difference among us and the other uh, competitors that we are analyzing the medical expertise that no one has ever done that before. Conventionally, uh, for patients to get access to the medical medical you know uh, experience is going through the referrals uh, through the doctors and uh, some self-initiated uh, way to find the you know hospitals like uh, you know look at the U.S. news uh, ranking. But the problem is that uh, hospital providers are, are ranked or uh, uh, evaluated by the performance reputation, patient experience. Nobody has ever touched to, to evaluate the particular knowledge, expertise for the particular disease. So and the second is the resolution. The granularity is one of the, the sharp features we provide, we have invented through our system. So we currently we, we can cover as many as 5,000 hospitals in the United States. We can perform analysis for up to 74,000 of uh, uh, health conditions. But uh, think about the con conventional ways to do that. Uh, the, the, like MD, uh, uh, like uh, yeah, WebMD, it can give you the knowledge base, but there is no clinically you know, actionable insight that can give you. Uh, for conventional rankings, it only gives you as sharp as uh, like a special rankings. But think about this, it, I mean, Anderson has been ranked as the number one for oncology uh, uh, for con four consecutive years. Is I mean, Anderson is the best for each and every cancerous situation. No, in oncology situation, probably not, because we're from Hopkins, right? <laughs> so that, that is my answer. So can I just ask you, in terms of this business, uh, why would you justify the need for AI or technology? Like, if you are a patient, and let's say I was in, I don't know, wherever, Saudi Arabia, and I, I feel really sick, isn't it better to talk to a human? What prevents this from being a concierge business, where on the other end, you actually have a human telling you who the best person is, actually listen, have empathy for the patient, and instead of having it being a technological process, actually care and try and make it. And people, if you're saying, are willing to pay a premium to be matched to where they are, and first of all, I think everything should get matched to Hopkins. But if you don't do that, uh, then if that's the case, then why not actually have a human? Like, why does technology become even a necessity in a business like this? Okay, so the question is very complicated. That's a very good one. Uh, so uh, the question is about medical necessity and also willing to pay, willingness to pay. So let me answer that. Uh, we, we got patients willing to donate one million dollar to to Johns Hopkins, but Hopkins still rejects that patient because we don't have the capacity to to treat that patient. That patient eventually end up, uh, you know, ad, uh, admitted to, to MGH for a very aggressive trial program. So there is a really difference, even among top hospitals, their expertise for particular disease. So uh, back to your, uh, you know, question regarding uh, put this in the shoes of uh, a high-end, uh, you know, high net worth uh, patients who are, have this, uh, you know, plan to come to states for the treatment. Um, so uh, first of all, the traditional uh, way to connect the patients, those kind of patients, uh, to the uh, world's leading institutions, they are considered services. Uh, that, that is very true. But what is that providing? What is value is it providing? The connecting them, the connector. But there is no one that can evaluate, that can tell you among the, the, all the top hospitals in the United States, which one has a proper, you know, better way to treat that well, one. No, so, you would do that. You'd still run a concierge, but you would do that. You know, you know who it is, so you would tell someone, like you, you would tell them. You, you know someone, I know someone. Yeah, we, we have a lot of patients like that. In the, in the past three years, I, I'm, a, I'm a PhD by training, not physician, but I have seen over uh, 200 patients. We have patients from, from uh, China, from, uh, from uh, Europe, as also from other you know, countries. So the problem is that the concierge, co concierge companies are providing concierge service, not medical analysis service, not medical referral services. Well, so no, I get it, but so, your edge would be a concierge service with medical analysis. So, so so our edge is that we, we are a step further. We help you perform the data analysis. And no matter what disease you have, we can help you perform the analysis. We also help them connect to those you know, care, care, uh, you know, uh, service uh, providers so that we can give one-stop solution for them and with uh, you know, one data solution that no one else has ever you know, provided before. So that is my, the, the value we created for this arena. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm 
my, my name is Qin Song Zhu. Um, <coughs> uh, my um, background is I, I got my PhD in biochemistry and I had my uh, postdoc training here under Dr. Nancy Davidson before she moved to uh, P uh, Pittsburgh. Um, I'm the CEO of the company called In Silico Medicine. Uh, our company uh, applying um, deep learning algorithm to de novo uh, design new molecule, a uh, drug bomb, uh, mo small molecules. So every year, um, pharma company, uh, pharma industry spends a billion dollars in the R&D um, process. So in 2017, um, the pharma industry, you know, um, spent uh, about 71 uh, billion dollars. So although every year uh, industry spends uh, that much money in the R&D process, but we only have about 50 uh, drugs, and new drugs were approved by FDA. So there's a huge opportunity to improve the efficiency um, of the IND process. So our company was funded in 2014. Um, we currently have about 80 uh, employees globally, and our uh, employees include from the, the expert from uh, biology, from the uh, chemistry, and uh, uh, of course the deep learning or machine learning uh, experts. And so we apply the deep learning uh, algorithm to develop end-to-end uh, -end drug discovery uh, uh, pipeline. And in difference to the uh, traditional uh, drug discovery uh, um, method, um, you know, we normally screen uh, or identify uh, drug candidates by screening a huge uh, compound library. So we uh, use a different approach. So we apply um, an algorithm called uh, generative adversarial uh, network and uh, um, reinforcement learning to um, develop end-to-end -end drug discovery uh, pipeline and use this pipeline to uh, de novo generate new molecules. So our first batch of the kinase uh, inhibitor uh, was partially uh, validated in it uh, was valid in vitro, uh, partially validated in vivo, and right now we are c uh, carrying on the more uh, in vivo exper experiment for these uh, uh, compounds. And uh, in December, our another drug candidate, we're going to have more read readouts uh, in December. So our business uh, our model is we carry on our internal drug development, just drug discovery, drug de development pipelines. At the same time, we also licensing our compounds to the big pharma company. We also provide uh, our service, uh, R&D service to big pharma company. Right now, we are working with four of the top 10 uh, big pharma company and provide either a licensed compound to them or provide serv service to them. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the challenges in this space is really um, the data, right? I mean, you have the analytic component um, that's scalable to an extent, but I think having um, population-based genetic databases that you can mine to actually marry um, a potential target with genetic information is actually really critical here. So um, I guess with the, with the observation being that targets that are genetically informed have a uh, 50% higher success rate in, in the regulatory space than those that are not, which is what you probably know. But um, how, do you, how are you going to address kind of the, probably the dearth of, of gen, why, you know, large enough genetic databases globally to, to scale this um, value proposition for your, for your, your company? Unfortunately, the due the echo, I didn't catch the, the, your question. Maybe you can. You I'm can asking you? about the, the genetic data that you're going to need to to actually do this deep learning on front to, to inform the discovery process and how, like what data sources you're going to be able to access and how, how widely scalable that is uh, that, outside uh, of the deep learning, which you, I'm sure you can do quite well. Um, maybe I can expand a little bit more about our pipeline. So actually, uh, I just here, I just talking a, a specific part of our pipeline is the novel generate new compounds. Actually, we have a pipeline from uh, at, the, at the beginning, at, uh, a target identification, uh, identification and uh, new molecule generation. And we also have pipeline to predict a potential clinical outcome. 
So we integrate um, uh, um, the mutation library. We also have the transcriptor library. So we, after we design our compounds, we actually do uh, uh, in silico screening to pr potential predict um, how I mean how we can uh, carry on this uh, this molecule to the next stage or what's the successful rate for this one. So this actually is one of our, our, our filters in, in our um, uh, reinforced learning the generation uh, um, model. The funding. Uh, congrats on the recent round of funding. Uh, Jim Mellon, and, and it's a pretty big round for Maryland company, and it's quite exciting that you were able to, to, to be where you are. There are 185 AI and drug discovery companies as we know it today. And of the 185, you can segment them in terms of looking at graveyard companies, things that resuscitate, things that have failed, things that are looking for new molecules and targets, and things that are making chemical modifications of things that already exist. Where in this spectrum do you sit? And how do you prevent, like the CEO of Novartis says that they no longer want to be a pharma company, they will be an AI drug discovery company. These contracts make sense now, but with 185 companies and acquisitions soon to come, how do you still stay competitive? It's a two-part question. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, um, actually, in the field right now, we already have one of the AI drug discovery was acquired, by, but they didn't announce it, actually. So if you know the, the field, probably you already hear the, the story. So in terms of the, um, ourselves, so we, um, uh, we position ourselves as a technology company. Also, we position ourselves as a drug discovery. So we, you know, uh, because in order to you know survive in the field, you have to generate uh, uh, revenues. So um, uh, of course you have to uh, generate IP. So in, uh, we have two two rule. One way is we develop our core technology, so and uh, apply IP. So this is for the long term uh, survival. And we also at the same time, as I mentioned, so we provide service and we also licensing our compound to. Uh, um, to the pharma company at different stages. So in that way, we can generate the revenue to sustain our, our, our development. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Bellinger with DeepLook. Uh, we are an image analysis and displaying technology. 20 years in the making, but we just created DeepLook uh, at, the, at the end of last year, specifically focusing on mammography. So why mammography? Well, uh, 40 million mammograms done every year, 1% of them actually uh, are positive for cancer. It's a science uh, essentially of a needle in a haystack, and we thought, what better way to use algorithms to see if we could sort out that needle in the haystack. Um, that's also why there's so many costly false positives, and also why early detection is still elusive. So what opportunity does digital mammography hold? Well, Applying algorithms to it, there's a lot of data buried in the digital images, especially the new tonal synthesis images that are beyond the range of human vision. So what we've done is create an algorithm that can see what can't be seen. When you do that, though, then you have two choices, and much of this conference today dealt with this question of probability and trust and confidence. We made a decision, tactical and business, that what we would do is take other technologies we had used uh, in image analysis, pattern recognition, and even, believe it or not, some game development, uh, and we went and recognized these hidden shapes, but then we went and captured the morphological shape, and we took that shape and then colorized it. So now what we're doing is presenting the radiologists with data they've never seen before, and we're presenting it in vivid color in what is otherwise a grayscale, and that's the technology. Now the challenge is, well to begin with, we're asking radiologists to interpret something they haven't seen before. So there's a training technology. Secondly, uh, in a related matter, is fitting that into the workflow. When you're reading 60 or 70 mammograms a day, uh, and, or in the morning rather, and then doing diagnostic mammograms in the afternoon, you can't spend a lot of time deep in deep look. So that's one aspect. And the final is, 
it's building the trust. And so we made a decision. Uh, we have the ability later with databases to do the analysis that AI ultimately provides. But we thought we'd begin by confidence, confidence building, show the radiologist what's in the black box. So we see ourselves as a utility, basically a flashlight into that black box of AI. I'll, I'll actually ask a question. Now, you picked a great target. Obviously, we started this whole conference with mammography. Um, in some ways, I, I'm impressed that you want to go after a target that uh, very established uh, computer-aided detection companies have been. What made you think, what's your competitive edge that you can go and beat up Hologic? You know who? Hologic. Hologic? <laughs> actually, I see Hologic as an ally, potentially. Uh, maybe even an acquirer. Uh, uh, what, I, I also think that AI companies are actually not all in com competition. Besides the fact that by necessity there's going to have to be consolidation, I think that some of the technologies are complementary. So we really made a deliberate pivot. We could have competed purely in the screening space where we were competing against the latest versions of Hologic, plus there's a, a tremendous products out there that are, that are coming online that do a good job of identifying or what I call mark and score. So they see a mammogram, they draw a box, draw a circle, and score the probability. And we had discussions about probability today. What we're doing is showing you what's there. And so in one case, we just signed an NDA with one of those leading AI companies because they can't show you what's in the black box, but we can. And when, and when I say that, I mean we can visually show you the morphology that has triggered both AI and our own system to say something's here. We're still leaving the radiologist to make the interpretation. And I think that may be tr a transitional tool as we gain to the point where probabilities become solid, or it might be that it's always a quality assurance tool. We're just not sure. One question, I'm wondering why you decided on breast cancer and mammography. I've done a couple of different startups and a lot of stuff in the image analysis space. Um, we were doing graphical trademark infringement and other kinds of diagnostic where we had to scale up a lot. So I looked for a problem that was big in scale, 40 million mammograms of which less than 1% proved positive, and that had a lot of false positives. And so I looked at that and then Truly, the other reason is it also has, I think, a compelling commu uh, consumer component. I don't know how much you follow mammography, but right now the FDA is reviewing the Mammography Act. Why? Because most of the problem is dense breast tissue. Forty percent of mammograms are compromised. The denser the tissue, the more it shows up as white in a mammogram because the attenuation is scales are the same. But the data is there. So we said this is an area that we could make big impact and that has a large market and would have a consumer demand because women with dense breasts are demanding a better solution. Are you worried that mammograms will not even be a thing 15 years from now? What if like, the future of breast cancer detection is a blood test or perhaps a multi-analyte solution which isn't? So is there, for now, this seems like it's, so what do you think is the future of breast yeah. cancer detection? Super good question, and nobody knows, but everyone has a lot of opinion about uh, how long is mammography going to continue to be the standard of care. There are some really interesting devices, both on ultrasound and AI applied to ultrasound. There's also abbreviated MRI, which in England, for example, is really uh, strong. So, but at the same time, right now, FDA approval for breast screening is just moved from 2D mammograms to tomal synthesis. And that cycle and all of the, the sunken cost and all of the regulatory hurdles and controls mean to me as an entrepreneur, there's a runway there. Is it five? Is it seven? Is it 10 years? And we're figuring on capturing all the data that we actually are, as we capture those morphological shapes, we store them and we have a database and then we have matching algorithms that will eventually allow us, for example, to compare. We work in ultrasound as well, so we might be able to compare the two. And so we'll, we think we can stay at the table, even as the, as the chairs shift. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Alcorn. I'm an oncologist here at Johns Hopkins. I will be presenting on an AI-infused decision support platform for guiding care in advanced cancer. 
Now, many of my patients with advanced cancer may develop bone metastasis, which is to say that their cancer, which may have started in, say, the lung, may have spread to the bone, where it may cause pain and significantly reduce quality of life. Thankfully, we have a host of interventions we can use to reduce pain in this setting, each of which have their own list of pros and cons, including things such as cost, durability of care, and duration of treatment. Um, ideally, when we're selecting for an ideal treatment for a patient, we'd be able to individualize that decision according to their prognosis, as well as their own preferences for the pros and cons of these interventions. Unfortunately, providers are notoriously inaccurate at predicting survival at the end of life, and we don't have a standard means for incorporating patient preference at this point. That's where the BMETS DSP comes into play. We've already addressed the prognosis issue by developing a machine learning model called the Bone Metastasis Ensemble Trees for Survival, which uses 27 prognostic covariates to predict survival for patients with bone metastasis. We tested this and developed a user interface, which is web-based and allows for the ease of data entry for those 27 covariates and displays a specific individualized patient prediction for survival from the BMETS model. Our next step is addressing the patient-facing aspect of this shared decision support platform and in order to encourage discussion of prognosis and selection of individualized care. So the challenges here are how do you optimize display and discussion of prognosis based on BMET's prediction from the patient perspective, and also how do we capture and then incorporate patient preferences uh, when making our decision, especially since these preferences exist on many levels. There's decision autonomy, there's if and how to receive information, and then how to actually incorporate their interpretation of the pros and cons when selecting a final treatment. I look forward to your feedback. Lots of ethics issues with this one, but fascinating um, nonetheless. I guess when you say prognosis, do you mean like 12 months survival or? Sorry, could you say that one more time? When you say prognosis, do you mean 12 months survival or what are you referring to in particular? So what we try to do with the BMETS model is actually display survival at a number of times following consultation from, from initial um, consultation for radiation oncology. Uh, which is where this was contextualized. So it's, a ti it's various times following consultation. And I guess have you thought about like the patient facing component of that? I guess that's kind of one of the things you're seeking feedback on, but I mean that's a very um, sensitive bit of information to communicate and in fact a lot of oncologists actually move away from even discussing prognosis in the clinical setting because it's so complicated to, um, to explain and may not be that valuable sometimes. Um, so what, 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 what is your thinking around kind of the patient-facing ethical concerns around prognosis? I think that it comes in several parts. One, decision autonomy would certainly be, um, and the way that the patient would like to receive information would certainly need to be incorporated very carefully into the model. And if the patient does not want to discuss, see, or in any way hear about their prognosis, that is a valid option. Um, but as, we're, as it pertains to value-based care in particular, where we have different markers of success in our delivery of care, uh, there are many at the end of life that, de that emphasize de-escalation of care, and I think that that necessarily incorporates infusing prognosis into our, our models in order to make sure we're meeting those, those landmarks. Thank you for having me. I'm a partnership manager at Alkin. So at Alkin, what we're doing is we're augmenting medical research um, rather than the clinical setting with AI predictive models. And we're working directly with our academic medical institutions and investigators to do this. And uh, what that means is we're partnering with clinicians and experts in a certain disease area. and um, answering a question that they believe medical uh, artificial intelligence will help answer. Um, and we're building predictive models with them to help understand uh, treatment response or patient prognosis and survival with their, their curated data sets. Um, in the past few years that we've been 
uh, working uh, as a company. We've built a zoo of models, which we then partner and collaborate with pharmaceuticals to implement into their clinical trial design, as well as uh, drug development to ultimately create solutions and treatments and acceler accelerate that de development for the patients um, and create that loop. Uh, and so, in this approach, in medical research, there's two key, um, key values that we bring into this. And the first one is using a multimodal data approach. We, we have experts and expertise in radiology, images, and pathology, and histology, digitized slides, and as well as genomics and clinical data. Uh, and the trend is really showing the, the influence and importance of pairing these data modalities together to answer que research questions and gain insights from uh, data that exists. Uh, and then a key other important factor in, in medical research and applying artificial intelligence to medical research is patient privacy and preserving that. Um, and that's one of the challenges that I want to speak to today is uh, one of our solutions that we've developed and invested in at Alkin is uh, federated learning uh, because ultimately to build powerful models you need enough data and sometimes a rare disease for a rare disease or a small institution looking at a disease uh, they might not have enough data so collaborations with external colleagues becomes really important uh, but doing that risks the patient data and, and patient privacy when pooling that data together. So um, federated learning, in case you haven't heard of it, um, we, it, what it really means is it's allowing for mach machine learning models to be trained across multifocal uh, data sets um, and the machine learning model and insights and or weights are being pulled across the different data sets without ever having to pool data but reaching a similar level of performance. Currently, we've won three grants in Europe to implement this into uh, the real world. Two of them are with um, two different loops of academic institutions to build, uh, to advance research. Both are in oncology. Uh, and then the third is actually in pharmaceutical uh, research and drug development. And 10 pharmaceuticals are going to be partnered together to uh, using a federated learning infrastructure to advance research there. But there's a lot more we can do in that space as well. So. Congratulations on uh, pulling off federated learning grants. Did you, from my own curiosity, were, was that the focus of the grants, the, the proof of concept to actually pull off federated learning in an effective fashion, or was it the, the focus of the company in general, or? I, I find the, the approach really, really interesting. Hopkins is very sensitive to data uh, safety. Yeah. So uh, we've been talking a lot about federated learning, so I'm interested to see how you guys pulled that off and whether that was the focus of the grants or rather that was a byproduct of, of where you're trying to go. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And so our, we have two founders. One has a background in machine learning um, research and um, machine learning te technology, and the other is an uh, oncologist by training. So their main goal was to advance medical research um, with m machine learning. Um, and so where our federated learning came into play is actually I believe, and I can get clarification, but I believe it actually started with a separate group and in France. Um, our, our company started in France, um, and we partnered together with them, and now, now it's all within Alkin yeah, to, to advance. You could maybe walk us through just a practical example of like, as you say, you work with pharmaceutical companies. How exactly are they benefiting off your solution? Just maybe even a real example to bring this to life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, um, and I can, if anyone's more interested in the pharmaceutical side, I can connect you with my pharma colleagues as well. But most of my work is definitely focused on the academic uh, medical institutions and s specific research projects and different uh, diseases. But on the pharma side, a, a key example is building uh, 
um, surrogate endpoints with our models that we've built uh, with our academic institutions and um, applying that to their clinical trials and ideally helping them. Is this applied already? Like, is Sorry. there one, a trial being run where this is applied already? Or? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Do we know, like, is there, which one, <laughs> no. or? Oh, um, it's confident, oh, okay. confidential, yeah. yes. One, okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so I, w I want to uh, thank our, our, our CEOs. Uh, thank you for, for pitching and, and sharing with us some of your issues. Thank you. Uh, I also like to thank uh, our expert panel. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of experience in this room, uh, and in some, in many ways, the experts are probably sitting all around here. So, what I would like to, uh, what we would like to offer you is, if you want to continue the conversation, uh, either with uh, individual panel members or with uh, the CEOs that you heard today. If you're interested in learning more, if you want to be connected to them, maybe you have a project that you want to propose, a partnership, a relationship, uh, please go to the Google form uh, that is represented by this link and just fill in the information. It's very simple, basically name, rank, serial number, and we will make sure that you're, con that you're connected. And what we will do is provide the information to the company so that they can network and be connected as well. Okay, so with that, um, the, uh, this is, I guess, uh, towards the end of the day now, and we're standing between you and the booze, but before that, Greg has to say something. Thank you. <laughs>